Here we are for the concluding plenary session of our conference. Uh, I hope that they have been very intense and insightful days. And now we have the occasion to add some other valuable pieces to our conference back, listening to the next keynote speaker, Sheila Jezenov. And for many for us, Sheila Jezenov doesn't need any introduction, as she is well known within the STS community. So just a few words before leaving the floor to her. She is a fourth Heimer Professor to, of Science and Technology Studies at the Harvard Kennedy School. And her works explore the role of science and technology in the law, politics, and policies of modern democracies, with particular attention to the nature of public reason. She was funding chair of the STS department at Cornell University and has had numerous distinguished visiting appointments in the US, Europe, and Japan. And Sheila also served on the board of uh, directors of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and as president of the Society for Social Studies of Science. She is author and or editor of several books, including, for example, the well-known Science at the Bar, and the last one, Science and the Public Reason. But because of its relevance in this occasion, and also because it's translated in Italian, I would like also to mention the science of nature, of course. Well, my brief introduction is closed, and I would like to give the, the, the floor to Sheila Jazanov. Thank you very much. So I'd like, first of all, to thank STS Italia for uh, the invitation and the chance to come back to Milan, which is something I always enjoy greatly. And very particularly, I'd like to thank Paolo and Marco for uh, patiently shepherding me through many months of arrangements and, and uh, vacillations and uncertainties on my part about travel arrangements and, and uh, intellectual arrangements. Uh, so um, I'm very grateful to be here um, at the concluding occasion of what has obviously been an unbelievably rich and exciting couple of days. Um, almost makes one forget the heat outside. Um, so I want to, uh, well, Paolo set me uh, tasks, um, so I was supposed to say something that was fitting for a closing plenary. It had to have something to do with STS, something to do with design, not be too narrow, not be too broad, and so on and so forth. So uh, I've tried to steer away among all of these compass points, um, and let's see if it works. Um, so I've been working on the collective imagination, which seems to me a very obvious point of contact between the design world and the STS world. And even if I don't mention design as such, I hope that in the interstices of what I say, people will see where the ideas of design and the ideas of knowledge and the ideas of making technologies come together in necessary and inseparable ways. But I want to begin with a little bit of the history of STS, partly to locate my own work and partly to say where I think we need to be going as we face the role of science and technology in increasingly complicated and interlinked worlds. So STS, of course, has a number of different genealogies and origin stories, but one of them is as a debate between disciplines, something that people often tend to forget. So the early um, theories in um, science and technology studies, in particular the sociology of scientific knowledge, abbreviated SSK, and actor network theory, abbreviated ANT, were both conversations about the place of sociology and what sociology ought to be doing. So the Edinburgh School of Sociology of Scientific Knowledge wanted to take the field of looking at science critically away from the philosophers 
And they posited that a way of going about doing this, this is in the work of David Bloor, is to assume an initial symmetry between true statements about the world and false statements about the world and see where that inquiry takes you. At a network theory begun in the Ecole des Mines, uh, took that as a starting point, as a given, but they too presupposed a symmetry and their quarrel was with sociologists who said that sociology is a human enterprise and we look at the relationships between humans and their organizations to do sociology. And as Michel Callon and Bruno Latour famously have observed, uh, that is just not the case. There are no human interactions that are not mediated with material things. And therefore, in doing sociology, they posited a connection, a symmetry between humans and non-humans. Now, that is all perfectly well known. But I come from America, and I was initially led into STS through something called science, technology, and society, not science and technology studies. And science, technology, and society always had a political edge. Now, in Italy, where so many things have a political edge, you don't need to be reminded that science and technology are political instruments. But in a sense, it seems to me that theoretically, the politics of science and technology has received less attention, less robust and sustained uh, development than the more formal disciplinary conversations under the headings of SSK and ANT above all. So what happens if we give pride of place, as I think we must, to the politics of science and technology, but in a world that already knows SSK and ANT and SCOT and all of those other abbreviations? So I want to talk about co-production, and I want to give you some examples that I will work through. Unfortunately, co-production does not easily lend itself to three-letter abbreviations, which it seems you must have in order to have a real niche inside of STS. Some of my students have been calling it CSTS, which sounds like a chemical compound, uh, but they mean that it's for constitutionalism, because in my own work, the idea of constitutionalism has been quite prominent. But I want to say that for co-productionist STS, whatever we call it, uh, there is a different kind of symmetry. And that is a kind of symmetry that relates to what things we look at in the world. Uh, we have become extremely good, as many of the speakers at this meeting have shown, at taking the products of science and technology and unpacking them in all kinds of complicated, interesting ways. But the symmetry that I would propose under the heading of co-productionist STS is that we look at every construct in the world, whether it's a product of science and technology or a product of social order, with the same degree of attention and the same deep-seated constructivism that we have learned to orient or to target towards the products of knowledge and of technology. So where would that lead us? Well, some things in this uh, community we can take as a given. STS obviously does a number of things extremely well as a mode of social analysis. It's extremely good at pointing out the contingency in the results that we come up with, whether in science or in technology, and at pointing to the possible existence of multiple competing worlds. We are astonishingly good at heterogeneity. I've never heard an STS talk, I think, in the last 10 years that didn't somehow stress hybridity and the fact that everything comes joined to everything else. There's a children's song in English uh, about how in the body everything hangs together because it's all one piece. And STS is very good at pointing out how the toe bone is attached to the foot bone, is attached to the ankle bone, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are, of course, supremely good at taking the material and trying to make it social. 
And we're pretty good at talking about moments of resistance, and we have a whole vocabulary for talking about the resistances that people meet when they try to put things together. But we're also less good at some other things. And I think we're not as far advanced as a community in explaining why we opt for some worlds and not for others. Um, of course, Foucault's power knowledge is not unknown to people in STS, but I think a serious questioning of the relationship between power and knowledge has gone missing from certain kinds and styles of STS analysis that are very commonplace. Also, if you look at social theory writ large, critical social theory, there are just words that keep appearing, like imperialism, like hegemony, like oppression, and somehow those words, I've never done the Google engrams or whatever, but they don't crop up all the time in STS writing. And um, lately, I've been working a lot with people in the critical legal studies community, and we had a very interesting meeting. We've been having these annually or semi-annually for several years now. Uh, we had an interesting meeting in which a young man from Colombia who was talking about uh, legal studies intersecting with STS said to me, what would STS have to say about poverty? Now, of course, STS has things to say about poverty, but STS does not normally put poverty at the center of its frame of analysis. And when I say symmetry, I mean, why not? Why should we not be able to put things like inequality and injustice? Not inequality as a result of the maldistribution of digital technologies, but inequality per se. How does this thing come into being? So can we do better? And to borrow a campaign quotation from President Obama's first campaign, yes, we can. Uh, we have sophisticated methods, we have tools. We also have an orientation and an ethos. This is very much not the Mertonian normative structure of science ethos. It's an ethos of skepticism. It's an ethos of sensitivity to the designed character of things in the world towards infrastructures and above all to the awareness that there are multiple possibilities available in the world. But we need new ways of looking. I think we need to retrain ourselves to ask where to look. Uh, and the where to look can be a lot more normative than work in STS on the whole tends to be. So where should we begin? Well, here just very quickly is a little uh, summary of the argument about co-production. The argument about co-production fundamentally is that when we build real states of the world, we're at one and the same time uh, designing ways in which we want to live in that world. So something like a carbon market, which is today a thing in the world. People bet money on it. They exchange real dollars and cents or euros. Um, but a carbon market presupposes a number of things about the world. And I'll come back to this as one particular um, example. So in States of Knowledge, um, the introductory theoretical chapter talks about the fact that co-production can be uh, put into methodological terms. There are particular moments at which we can look for co-production. There are particular ways in which co-production is achieved. And these can be translated to some extent into an answer to the question, where should we look? Uh, so in some quarters of STS, it's become um, somewhat fashionable to lay out rules of method. I myself am typically rather resistant to rules of method because I think people should figure out their own rules of method to some extent and disciplines get very rigid if they adhere to rules of method too tightly. On the other hand, if everybody's going to brandish rules, why not create some ourselves? Uh, so here is a, a new for this occasion special slide about five rules of method. Um, do not follow the scientist. Go where science, technology, and design have consequences. Do not ask only how claims are made, but also ask why claims are accepted. 
So not just the production side, but also the reception side. Don't stop by saying objects condition the way we live. It's rather clear by now. But also ask in what ways, with what normative consequences, who are the winners and losers. Don't only go where novelty beckons, but also pay attention to what is not novel and what stays the same. And don't be seduced by matters of fact, even when they are dressed up as matters of concern, but ask why some facts matter and others don't. Obviously, a lot is packed into that because in asking why some facts matter, you also have to ask to whom, when, how, under what circumstances. So each of these rules can be unpacked into worlds of inquiry. All right, so let's take an example. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Beijing, and it was the day after Steve Jobs' death, and I was just walking along on the streets, arbitrary little community in Beijing, and there was a fruit drinks store, and it had uh, an obviously quickly photocopied up picture on the door announcing his death. Uh, so this is Beijing. It's some arbitrary neighborhood not having to do with an Apple store or anything like that. And then, of course, a few years later, the biography appeared. And this is the way a typical American bookstore looked. But then I was in Buenos Aires and found that. And then I was in Dubai and found that. Um, so clearly, the fact of the spread of this man, his face, the book, his life, it is a phenomenon of the techno-scientific world. It is something that is among STS's topical matters of concern. Clearly, something is traveling. Uh, but it's not as simple as a fact. And it's not as simple as an inscription. What is doing the traveling? That is itself an inquiry. Is it the idea of Steve Jobs? And if so, in what way is that idea so powerful? Is it the lore of Apple, the fact of the design of the object and the branding and all of those other things that we could talk about? Or is it, as some political scientists would like to say, the soft power of American culture that makes all of this uh, have this uh, uh, capacity to break through into uh, other sorts of domains. I also, by the way, find the particular juxtapositions of other books along with Steve Jobs' biography interesting. So particularly in the Dubai one, there's the Sheikh, head of the United Arab Emirates, who is talking about his vision of excellence, whereas in the Argentinian bookstore, it's a Brazilian dissident um, uh, education expert and, and philosopher, Paulo Freire, whose book is juxtaposed next to Jobs' biography. So even these windows tell you something about the, about the juxtapositions and what exactly is traveling and why and how. So why does it travel? Is it that there are centers of calculation? One could work that out, there's certainly an economy in the sale of books, and it could be something to do with that. Or is it something to do with capitalisms, and if so, what kind of capitalism? Is it related to Benedict Anderson's print capitalism? And if so, how is it picked up? So is there one imagined community in which Steve Jobs has an iconic status in death as he did in life, or not one imagined community, but other ones. And I think that the simple visual fact of the juxtaposition of other books leads us to think that it may be multiple imagined communities. And where the book, the person, what the person stands for drop into a culture uh, is itself something that we might want to explore and understand better. This is not just about are you a Mac person or are you a PC person? It is something wider than that going on in the world. So in order to deal with those sorts of questions, one of the ideas I've been playing with is the idea of sociotechnical imaginaries. And just very quickly, it's already gone through a couple of definitions. One was in a, an article that my colleague Sang Hyun Kim 
and I published in Minerva a couple of years ago. I won't bother reading out the, dis the definition. Uh, you can see it and look it up anyway. But note that we put in national in uh, the definition in the third line. Um, and in the book that will be coming out next year with Chicago, that is about socio-technical imaginaries, uh, we've taken the word national out, not because we uh, want to reject the idea of national socio-technical imaginaries. I still think those are extremely important because I think the nation state is an extraordinarily important collector of the um, of social will and social reason, uh, but because imaginaries can happen at any level of organizational stabilization. So as long as it's collectively held and institutionally stabilized and publicly performed, we think that imaginaries have a lot of scope as an analytic, uh, um, uh, more specific analytic concept under the heading of co-production. Now let's turn to uh, a couple of case studies that illustrate something about uh, why thinking in imaginaries attunes us to a different set of phenomena in the world than we might be thinking about otherwise. So we can think about nuclear power or other energy sources from a lot of different standpoints, and I'm just very quickly going to walk you through what it would look like if we thought about it through the lens of imaginaries. So historically, of course, it's well known that uh, nuclear energy got started as a counterpoint to the military uses of the bomb. The famous Eisenhower speech in the United Nations pledging the United States to a course of using atoms for peace was one seminal moment. But at the same time, there was an entire ideology of development taking place in which the idea of atoms for peace found fertile soil. Uh, this well-known quotation, at least well-known to American students of technology, from Louis Strauss, the first head of the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, captures uh, those more ideological dimensions of what was going on with nuclear power. So it is not too much to expect that our children will enjoy in their homes electrical energy too cheap to meter. That phrase, too cheap to meter, has become one of these circulating tropes in the idea of energy. But note what else he thinks will disappear. Great periodic regional famines will become matters of history. People will travel effortlessly over the seas and under them and through the air. Minimum danger at great speeds. I mean, this is before the, the coming of age of civil aviation, so you, you have to remember the historical dimension, will experience a lifespan far longer than ours. Um, so all of these things have to some degree come to pass, but it was also a promissory note at that moment in the mid-1950s. And we can see there certain themes that colored the idea of development and laid the basis for thinking about sustainability years on down the line. So the themes of progress, that there's unending growth, and unlimited development, and the famous report that Veneva Bush wrote, Science, the Endless Frontier, as crystallizing that idea in a title. Certainly the most uh, cited uh, uh, title of a government report that I've ever heard of. Um, efficiency, um, there was a, an efficiency expert who worked for the Ford Motor Company, but who also wrote, uh, well, who also uh, conducted his family with 12 children in such a way that his son wrote a book cheaper by the dozen. Uh, so all of, particularly those of you who are Italians, might want to rethink your population policies and consider how it might become much uh, easier to run families if you had a dozen children each. Um, accessibility, that's the electrical energy too cheap to meter. Eradication, so getting rid of certain kinds of things. Um, all sorts of social blights being treated almost like pollution as something you can eliminate totally with the right kinds of instruments. And also a commitment to a certain kind of idea of transparency that you can see into society and cure its ills through managerial interventions. It's the kind of uh, premise that 
James Scott has talked about as legibility. So all of these elements of the modernist imaginary were there in that little quotation, but of course they were circulating far more widely. And one place that they were circulating was in the developing world. Um, in India in particular, in independence uh, period India, there were competing visions about how technology ought to develop and Jawaharlal Nehru's ideas were very much coincident with and sympathetic towards the kind of ideology that Strauss expressed in his vision of science, technology, and progress. And it took shape particularly in the great dam building projects of India. The most famous one that Nehru referred to was the Bakranangal Dam. And this quotation from him is, again, something that if you study the developing world and science and technology in the developing world, and in particular the imaginary, imaginaries of science and technology in that period, this is well known. Bakranangal project is something stupendous, something tremendous, something stupendous, something which shakes you up when you see it. Bakra, the new temple of resurgent India. So, you know, secularism combined with progress, combined with the same ideas of uh, electricity and, and, and energy being widely available to everybody and this being uh, a symbol of progress. So two different sides of the world, same year, two different statements about what we expect out of science and technology coming into our lives. So this is not about matters of fact traveling, it's not about single objects, it's about making worlds. And you know, the, the title of this conference suggests that that is what we're collectively most interested in in STS, and that is the thing that we ought to be investigating with all our skills. It played out in all kinds of ways, so one of the major dam developed development um, enterprises was in the western part of Bengal in the Damoda Valley um, complex in uh, West Bengal and Bihar. And I actually grew up in its shadow because my father was uh, executive secretary of the DVC when I was a child. And it's clear that there was skepticism even then. So the, it was not a matter of just a top-down vision articulating itself, but that people felt that there were other things that needed to be thought about. So these are some quotations actually from my father during this TVA phase. This TVA phase is the Tennessee Valley Authority. So again, you see traveling social orders. Uh, a well-known Indian engineer used to proclaim off and on that he was going to build the highest dam in the world. Uh, suggesting implicitly a new yardstick for measuring national greatness, um, that many engineers in India have left to themselves like to build monuments to themselves, regardless of the time and cost involved as a commonplace of history. India had yet to discover this. So this is um, um, an STS heritage that I was actually not myself aware of while it was going on. Um, okay, so that's some of the historical backdrop to sustainability, which Chetil Fallon talked about yesterday. And I think that to complicate even the very complex and rich picture that he produced, uh, we have to get back into these sort of multiple histories. Uh, and I think, in fact, sustainable development is not a boring story if you uh, actually, or sustainable design. These are not boring terms if you parse them out in the ways that I'm suggesting. So the birth of sustainability has a lot to do with uh, that image. Uh, and in particular, it has a lot to do with globalization and uh, a design sensibility that says that solutions for sustainability have to be found at a scale that is translocal and probably planetary. And you find this already in the report that puts sustainable development into the discourse as something that we cannot avoid. This is taken from Our Common Future, 
um, in the middle of the 20th century, we saw our planet from space for the first time. So elsewhere, I've written about the fact that we saw our planet from space for the first time is probably a historically incorrect statement, depending on how you understand we and how you understand saw, because cartographers were already drawing the planet as the center of, uh, uh, well, hanging in space as uh, an object of vision for several centuries beforehand. Um, and then they talk about uh, the fact that this is a moment of discontinuity comparable to the Copernican Revolution. And then from space, we see a small and fragile ball dominated not by human activity. So that not by human activity is, um, you know, they, they believe in actants and edifice, but by a pattern of clouds, oceans, greenery, and soils. So human beings are at best peripheral in the World Commission sensibility about sustainability. And this then translates into ideas about how we should deal with problems such as climate change. But not everybody buys into that idea 